Hi guys, it's Emily here. We are at Fleet Base East in Sydney alongside HMAS Canberra today for our Navy Officer Facebook Live Q&A. We'll be here for the next hour, so make sure you get your questions through to us. I'm here with Andrew, Simon and Deirdre this afternoon. Guys, can you introduce yourself? Uh, tell us about your job role, how long you've been in the Navy and where you're currently posted to. I'm Maritime Logistics Officer on board HMAS Canberra. I joined the Navy 10 years ago um, as a sailor, as a combat systems operator. However, in 2015, I decided to commission as a Maritime Logistics Officer. I'm Andrew. I uh, joined the Navy three years ago. Uh, I'm an Officer of the Watch on board HMAS Canberra at the moment. Uh, so I've gone through uh, both uh, my new entry officer course and then through my uh, junior warfare application course and finished that at the end of last year uh, and so I'm now on my first full sea posting on board. Hi, I'm Simon McCowan. I'm a Marine Engineer Submariner. Uh, I'm currently at uh, Navy Headquarters in Canberra. I've joined the Navy as an undergraduate entry officer and uh, been in the Navy for 12 years now. Wonderful. So right behind us we can see HMAS Canberra. So can you tell us some of the features on, on HMAS Canberra and for those of you who have been on board, Simon obviously you're the submariner. <laughs> What's your favourite part of the ship? So uh, HMAS Canberra has two uh, ASI pods. So they're basically like two outboards uh, that are on the base of the hull. Uh, along with two bow thrusters which enable us to hold the ship in one position uh, and while in that position we can both launch and recover aircraft as well as launch and recover landing craft all at the same time. A key feature on Canberra for me is how many bunks it has. There are 1400 bunks so it has a crew of about 450 people however we can surge up to 1400 uh, embarked forces. Um, and it also has a light vehicle deck and a heavy vehicle deck, which pretty much is able to house all the vehicles and all the uh, army equipment that uh, we carry for the army guys that end up going ashore. Yeah, wow. So what made each of you want to choose an officer role in the Navy? Um, Simon, did you always want to be a submariner? Um, so I initially joined the, the Navy to be an aeronautical engineer and I was studying um, engineering at the time. Uh, so uh, with an engineering degree, the options open to me uh, were to become an officer in the Navy. I subsequently through my officer selection board I actually was selected to be a marine engineer. Uh, I haven't regretted that decision at all and I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, once I was in the Navy and during my initial training that's when I decided I wanted to be a submariner for the, the different role that submariner engineers have over the surface world. So I uh, also sought the role uh, rather than necessarily an officer career. Uh, so for me, it was very much the role that a maritime warfare officer and especially an officer of the watch has on board a ship where we're on the bridge, we're doing the navigation, uh, keeping the ship safe. It was all about that role that I really sought after rather than specifically being an officer, which came because I wanted that role. For me, it was all about uh, the opportunities uh, an officer could provide. Uh, so it allowed me to be able to study a university degree. So I did a Bachelor of Business through ADFA. Um, also, in particular, Maritime Logistics Officer, the um, positions and posting locations um, I found really interesting. It can be in Sydney or over in Fleet Base West. Um, as well as overseas, there was some opportunity yeah, for postings. So did each of you undergo the same training to become officers in the Navy? So we all have conducted the, the common Navy engineer, sorry, Navy new entry officer course, um, which is a six month course down at uh, Jarvis Bay. But following that, I went off and did uh, the Marine Engineer application course at HMAS Cerberus in Melbourne, which was six months course, bringing, um, transitioning my engineering skills to the Navy before I posted to a frigate, HMAS Toowoomba, as an assistant marine engineer officer. Um, on completion of my time as an assistant marine engineer officer, and once I was qualified as an engineer, I then went to the submarine school at HMAS Stirling in Western Australia, uh, just south of Perth, where I trained for 10 months prior to joining the submarine to uh, get awarded my dolphins. So for me, uh, after I completed a uh, new entry officer course, I came to HMAS Watson in Sydney uh, and commenced my junior uh, warfare application course 
So that takes overall uh, two years. Uh, so we start off uh, with shore phases where we spend time at HMAS Watson learning those key skills we need uh, for uh, a maritime warfare officer, for an officer of the watch. And then we uh, spend times between those uh, on seagoing vessels. So the first time is on a major fleet unit. So I was on a frigate during that time. And then the second time that I went to sea uh, during that course, uh, I was on a minor war vessel. So I was uh, based out of Darwin on a patrol boat up there. So Andy and I were on NEOC together, which is the new entries officers course uh, in Creswell. Um, from there, I went down to ADFA and completed a Bachelor of Business. Beginning of this year, I spent 12 weeks down at HMA Cerberus in Victoria, uh, and I did the Maritime Logistics Application course, and that was for 12 weeks learning the basic skills that I would require at sea. And I'm now doing my assistant time on board Canberra. Uh, that would be for nine months, um, and then I'll go over to a shore-based unit uh, to do a final three months, and then back down to Cerberus to do my primary qualification. Um, and then I'll be able to go back to see as a deputy. Yeah, fantastic. Now we've got some questions coming through already, which is wonderful, so we'll dive straight into them. Um, considering we've got HMA's Canberra behind us and we did just talk about some of the facilities, we have got a question. What are the gym and fitness facilities like on the ship? So there are four gyms on board a ship as well as a physical trainer. Um, so there are two PT classes run each day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So uh, you can get down to one of those or there's the opportunity to do your own workout um, in one of the gyms. But also with the size of the ship, it also gives you a great opportunity to run around on the light vehicle deck or the heavy vehicle deck um, and then just with some of the other guys that are on the ship to be able to do a workout with them. So yeah, it's pretty good. You're working out with a bit of a view up there, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Um, and what about on a submarine? Um, on a submarine, we don't have four gyms, unfortunately. Uh, we have a couple of spaces where we can work out. Um, we typically sail with at least one exercise bike and a rowing machine. Uh, that's spread across 60 people. Uh, and we also carry weights, either dumbbells or uh, kettlebells, and sometimes things like a chin-up bar get installed. So for myself, I exercise by doing a half an hour or so on the exercise bike and doing some body weight exercises like chin-ups or push-ups. Yeah, great. Uh, now, Luke has asked, do you have any advice for upcoming officer selection boards? I think uh, a big thing uh, is to be proactive in uh, learning about your role, um, learning about the Navy, what the Navy's doing, where the Navy's currently operating, uh, and what that means uh, for you, uh, as well as for the nation. Uh, if you can answer those sort of questions, um, that will really go, uh, really help you towards uh, your officer selection boards. Yeah, I guess it's understanding what role you want to go into and specifically um, what does that role entail. Um, so the Defence Force recruiting website is probably a really good place to go and um, check that out. It's got a lot of information on there and there's lots of good videos that can, it talks about, I know it talks about NEOC and uh, job specific roles if you want to know more. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a couple of questions here about education. So uh, if you don't quite get the ATAR required for ADFA, can you still be accepted? Uh, and uh, education requirements for the selection board. Now, obviously, all of that information is also online at our Defence Jobs website. So for any education queries, you can jump onto there or you can also contact your local Defence Jobs uh, recruiting centre and they'll be able to give you that info as well. Uh, now, John has asked, do you get seasick? <laughs> Uh, I'll answer that question what, for myself. Uh, yes, I do get seasick at times uh, on surface ships. I've never been seasick on submarines, uh, and I've been seasick twice in my 12-year career, uh, and that was on um, uh, HMAS Kanimba, which was a landing platform auxiliary, which we no longer have. Typically, we feel a bit, I feel a bit queasy on the initial day of sailing, get a bit of a headache, um, but then that will you quickly overcome uh, that and fall into a routine. For the submariners out there, when we, the submarine actually dives, it's a lot more stable uh, and typically nobody gets seasick once the submarine has dived, which is great uh, because there's not a lot of uh, um, ventilation change out. But um, with that saying that, 
for those people who do have a chronic seasickness issue that is medically based, the Navy is very good in supporting people and uh, providing um, medical treatments to help support people remain at sea and fulfil their job at sea. Yeah, so I, I also get seasick. Uh, so during my time I spent up on patrol boats. Um, I got seasick a, a couple times up there. I was up during the wet season, so there were a few times when we were at sea very close to cyclones uh, and sailing around them. So you get heavy seas and uh, during those times I'd start to get a bit seasick. So for me, Navy supports by providing seasickness tablets and I take seasickness tablets and I was perfectly fine after that. So there is the support there. Camera though, it's a pretty big ship, so it doesn't move too much. That would move around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Now, uh, let's take a deeper dive into your job role, Andy. Now, you are a maritime warfare officer uh, on board HMA's camera behind us. We did spend some time yesterday in your work environment going through your job role and uh, what it is that you do. So let's have a look at that. So I'm here with Andrew. Andrew, can you tell us where we are? Yes, we are on the bridge of HMAS Canberra, where I spend most of my time as a maritime warfare officer. Wonderful. And can you tell me a little bit about your core responsibilities as a maritime warfare officer? Yes, so at sea, I spend most of my time up here navigating, keeping the ship safe, as well as doing a whole heap of other different roles from up here. So I liaise with the flight team on here, so we launch recover aircraft. We also have a landing craft that I liaise with what we call dock control, and they launch and recover landing craft as well. Wow, so you uh, undertake quite a bit of leadership and management training as part of your role as a maritime warfare officer. So can you tell me how important that is to your job? So that training that the Navy provides is crucial for my job up here on the bridge. It enables me to get the best out of my team and enables me to do that in other teams that I work with, both in the Navy and outside of the Navy. There are other skills that those leadership training courses provide me with. They provide me with better time management as well as better public speaking and uh, other ways that I can transfer those skills and be better outside if I decide to leave the Navy. Can you tell me a little bit about the different specialisations for a maritime warfare officer and do you get to choose? So there are a number of different specialisations. There are principal warfare officers, of which there's the surface, subsurface sphere of warfare, as well as the air sphere of warfare. There are navigators, as well as meteorologists, hydrographers, submariners, and mine clearance diving officers. At the end of your initial training, you put forward two preferences. These preferences get taken into account, and generally you'll get one of them. However, you get a specialisation chosen for whatever best suits the Navy team. Absolutely. Now, can you run me through some of your daily duties on board HMAS Canberra as a maritime warfare officer? Yes, so when we're at sea, I spend two four-hour watches up here on the bridge doing that navigating, keeping the ship safe, launching and covering aircraft. When we're alongside, I have a normal job. I go to work 7.30 and leave at 4 o'clock to go home. And I do a lot of admin and preparation planning for different times when we go to sea ahead. Wonderful. Thanks, Andrew. So that was a little bit of a look at the Maritime Warfare Officer role, particularly on board HMAS Canberra. Now, make sure you're getting your questions through. We have had plenty come through, so we'll jump straight back into them. Now, Tamika has asked, are part-time roles available? OK, so there are available. There are some roles within the reserve that are permanent part-time positions, which provides a means to do um, work ashore and sometimes op relief on board on ships. The Navy and the Defence Force as a whole is transitioning to a, a more flexible workplace arrangement. I know the old Chief of Navy used to say he'd like people to have a 40, uh, sorry, correction, a 20 year career spread over 40 years. Um, and that, enable, that also enables people in those office positions um, to come up with some flexible workplace arrangements. So for myself next year, my wife is going back to work and we have a, a one year old daughter. Um, I will be working four days a week three days in the office and the other day split across the rest of the week. So my office is supportive of that and that enables my wife to go back to work and my daughter to be uh, in childcare only three days a week. Some positions though, however, uh, can't be flexible. Typically those positions on board a ship where we need people to be there at all the time, but that's developing an ever evolving space. 
Yeah, so I had um, one of the sailors come up last week uh, requesting to be able to do uh, flexible work arrangements um, and that's really important that we try and give her the flexibility uh, to manage her lifestyle. Um, so it might be coming in late one day uh, while we're alongside and she just might work back an hour or two later to be able to achieve what she needs to do. Yeah, there's absolutely opportunities available yeah. for that. Uh, now, Ricardo asked, how do I join the Navy? So I guess we can have a talk about your recruiting process and uh, what it was like for you in terms of, I guess, preparing for your aptitude test um, and your assessment and OSB. Probably more likely, Andy, you, um, you went through the system a few years ago? Yes, so uh, for me it took uh, 18 months yep. uh, from when I first started that application uh, through to when I first started the new entry officer course. Uh, that was for a couple of different reasons, um, but throughout that process, uh, it, preparations for me was just about, a lot of the time was spent on the website, um, attending different things that I could, uh, constantly talking to DFR about different events that they had, uh, that they were running so that I could get to know both the role that I was wanting, uh, as well as getting to know the Navy. Uh, when I went through, I had a fairly clear idea of what I wanted. Uh, so uh, if you do have that clear idea of what exactly you want to do, um, then that, that does help uh, in the sense that you can go in seeking that specific role. Um, but if, if you're a bit unsure of exactly what there is out there, then uh, at least an understanding of who the Navy are uh, and what roles there sort of are available is, I guess, a good way to prepare for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nikki has asked uh, what the criteria is for the Navy. So uh, what does the Navy look for when they're recruiting officers? So I guess we can talk about some of the key characteristics, particularly if you're entering the Navy and you know exactly what kind of role you're looking for. <laughs> Yes, so uh, the main thing that uh, they look for generically over officers, I think, is just those leadership skills. Uh, so if you've got uh, experience in that leadership area, um, how big or small, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but to be able to have that, that experience, that's really, really helpful um, because they know uh, that you're seeking those leadership roles. It's that personality that that sort of thing reflects. Uh, I guess at the same time, that sort of maturity in the sense that uh, when you join the Navy, whether you are uh, straight out of school or not, your life then is going to be a lot more independent than a lot of those people you're currently at school with because you're going to be moving into living effectively by yourself or in dorms or anything like that. So you're going to be doing a lot of those uh, life skills for yourself. So. Uh, to demonstrate that maturity uh, through uh, previous experiences, it's that personality I think that they look for. But at the same time, if you don't necessarily have those, uh, the Navy's really good at setting you up um, and providing you uh, all these opportunities to be able to develop skills, uh, it, whether it be through the NEOC, so the 20 week course, um, and then right throughout your career, um, all the way up as high as there's um, leadership training as well. Yeah, so. Fantastic. Now, uh, Trevor asked, are there any prerequisites in terms of education for a submariner? So, specifically for a submariner, there's no prerequisites. Um, it's whatever the prerequisite it is that the role that you're joining for. So as an engineer, that means if you're a graduate, then you, you have an engineering degree. If you're entering through the ADFA scheme, then it's um, having the prerequisite year 12 results and marks to enter Ad ADFA, or if it's through the Defence University uh, sponsorship scheme, then it's ha having completed a year at university successfully and showing that you can learn. So from specific for Submariner, no, it's whatever stream that you're going to. Okay, great. Tommy asked, how many uh, maritime warfare officers or officers are there on board uh, HMAS Canberra? So, uh there's a broad area of roles that maritime warfare officers take on board HMS Canberra. So at the moment we have four officers of the watch that are fully qualified uh, and can uh, be the officer of the watch by themselves. Uh, we have a number of people that are in that training progress at the moment. Uh, 
And then we have others that have specialised and are further down their career path. So we obviously have a navigator as well as principal warfare officers. So there, there are a large number of uh, maritime warfare officers just at different career paths, uh, career points. Yeah, great. Alessandra asked, how is managing the long 24-hour officer of the day duties? <laughs> Well, I guess they're only uh, 24 hours, so yeah. um, you take it step by step. Yeah. Um, and you do have a team of uh, senior sailors and um, junior non-commissioned officers uh, underneath you that have specific roles and responsibilities to help you carry out your roles and responsibilities. Um, it's all about uh, keeping people informed, making sure that you know uh, who to go to if uh, something does happen um, and then just working with your team for that 24 hours. Yeah, absolutely. I think an important thing is that you don't have to be awake for the full 24 hours. <laughs> there are, as as uh, Deirdre just mentioned, there are people working for you and, and there's a team called a duty watch. Uh, somebody will always be awake and they're doing rounds and maintaining safety of the, of the ship or the submarine. As the officer of the day, you're just responsible and need to be on call and on board the ship or submarine during that day. Great. Uh, so, Reese has asked, what are the biggest personal challenges that serving in the Navy has presented you with and how did you overcome them? So, the big, one of the, my biggest challenges was uh, my wife is from the UK and uh, whilst I was posted to HMAS Waller as the Marine Engineer Officer, uh, she was still living in the UK. So, we managed a long distance relationship for over three years whilst I was serving in the Navy and that was quite difficult and uh, keeping us, uh, keeping a, our relationship close during that period of time when we had some limited communication um, was difficult but we reverted to some old, old school methods of writing letters um, and that process for me writing a component of a letter every day um, kept me in contact in touch with my wife which was which is great um, uh, so yeah that was my biggest challenge I think Communication with loved ones and being away from them is always a big challenge. Uh, it's, I think, maybe a, a different challenge whether you're on a surface ship or whether you're on a submarine, but I think that's always a big challenge. Uh, but for me, I, uh, my f uh, junior warfare application course phase two time, so when I went to sea I went uh, on a frigate. Uh, and we were away for a, a fair while, uh, but I joined that all by myself. So I was in a strange city uh, all by myself on a brand new ship with a lot of other people that I'd never met before, uh, doing something that I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so that was probably the biggest challenge was getting into that role, um, but I think it's definitely helped me later on, um, and it was one of the the best times that I've had in the Navy as well. I think the uh, biggest challenge for me was adapting to Navy lifestyle. I didn't grow up in a Navy family. I had no um, family members that came from the military. Uh, so just adjusting to military lifestyle pretty much. Um, understanding the routines and why the military does stuff um, was really challenging for me. But once I actually understood why we do what we do, um, it became a lot easier. And 10 years later, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have a question here. Um, I have just lost it, but it was, how often in a 12 month period would you spend at sea versus on shore? So does it differ as you progress? Yeah, it really varies for each individual um, and also what platform you're posted to. Mm. So uh, I joined Canberra back in April this year um, and we spent probably about half the time out at sea okay. um, with various port visits in between um, and then sea to shore rotation can vary um, between, you can spend 12 months uh, at sea, uh, 18 months up to two years at sea, um, and then you can also do a shore rotation um, for up to two years as well. So it really varies um, on where you are at, in your career. Yeah, great. Uh, so yesterday we actually spent some time with Simon. Uh, you took us through a little bit more about what your role as a marine engineer submariner entails. So let's have a look at that footage. 
I'm here with Simon, who is visiting HMAS Canberra this week. But Simon, you are actually a marine engineer submariner. So can you tell me what the role of marine engineer entails on board a submarine? Yes, OK, so an engineer on board a submarine is a very similar role to that of a surface ship, providing technical advice to the commanding officer and ensuring that the maintenance of all the mechanical systems and the operation of those systems uh, is happening correctly. But in addition to those technical role on board a submarine, you're part of the what we call the Action Information Organisation, which works in the control room, the nerve centre of the submarine. So we're providing information to the commanding officer so he or she can make tactical decisions. Uh, I keep watching the periscope, I oversee sonar operators and the combat system operators and update the navigation plot as required. So it's a varied role and that, which has an operational flavour. Fantastic. And what are some of the pathways available for someone looking to become a marine engineer? So I joined the Navy as an undergraduate entry officer. The Defence Force paid for my last year of my degree. But you can also join through ADFA, studying mechanical or electrical engineering at ADFA, or having completed a, an engineering degree at an accredited civilian university. And why would you recommend marine engineer in a submariner capacity? What drew your attention to that role and what keeps you there? What drew me was the challenge, the operational nature and the responsibility. So from my perspective as an engineer, the responsibility that I gained being the subject matter expert, providing advice to the commanding officer, occurred a lot earlier in my career than if I chose a civilian pathway. I attained my Chartered Professional Engineer status a lot earlier compared to the rest of my engineering cohort from university. And what kind of key skills and interests would benefit someone looking for a career as an engineer in the Navy? The key interests for anyone who wants to be an engineer would be physics and maths because they are the underlying components of engineering, but they also need to have a problem solving mind and think analytically and critically so that when you are that subject matter expert to the commanding officer, those issues you can solve in internally to the submarine. Great, thanks Simon. So thank you guys. Please make sure you're getting your questions through. We'll dive back in. Now Nicholas has asked, uh, what were your various professional academic backgrounds prior to joining the Navy? So uh, at uh, high school in year 12, I studied physics, maths, maths, uh, university physics, uh, English and German before going to university. And then I studied a Bachelor of Engineering, uh, specializing in mechanical engineering. I was fortunate also the Navy um, sponsored me to go to Glasgow and I studied marine engineering for my last semester of my degree. Great. So when I finished school I went to uni as well. Uh, so I went to the University of Sydney and studied a Bachelor of Science um, and so I then completed an honours year so I did a, a fourth year on top of the, the, addition, the normal three uh, doing that in geophysics. So I completed Year 12 um, and then joined the Navy a uh, short time after that. Um, however, uh, Navy has given me the opportunity to be able to study at ADFA. So it's through University of New South Wales um, down in Canberra um, and I've got a Bachelor of Business out of that. Oh, great. Yeah. So Mohack asked, what is day to day like on board a ship? So for me, uh, I'm a day hand, so I'll get up in the morning about 6am, go and have breakfast, um, I'll go check in with the personnel um, sailors and I'll probably do finance work uh, all morning. Um, there it will be probably lunchtime, after lunch I'll probably check in with um, the support sailors um, and they run the canteen and make sure the finance side of that is all good. Um, I'll also be liaising with the supply chain sailors um, and helping out if we have any defects or um, if we require any stores. Um, and then of an evening, um, I'll help the chefos or the chefs um, with serving dinner. Um, and then after dinner, I might get a chance to go to the gym or participate in one of the PT sessions that happen in the afternoon. Um, and then that's my day to day. Yeah, great. Yeah. So uh, I'm a watch keeper, so my day is usually worked around whichever watches that I've got for that day. So uh, normally uh, we run uh, what's called one in three, so I'll do two for our watches uh, over the course of that day. And usually that'll mean getting up uh, sort of the hour uh, 
ish before that watch. Yep. Um, going on, spending that four hours uh, on the bridge, uh, keeping the ship safe and doing that navigation piece. Uh, once I've finished my watch and I've handed over to the next person, I'll spend a bit of time doing any administration uh, work that I need to do um, in different roles that I have on board. Um, and then uh, have maybe a bit of time to myself, um, depending on what the ship's doing at that time, how long that administration is going to take to do, uh, and then uh, roll into my second watch for the day uh, before then getting some rest overnight. As a marine engineer on board a submarine, I'm, I'm a watchkeeper as well. We keep uh, six on, six off. Uh, so I share the weapons electrical engineer is on the opposite watch to myself. I typically get up at six o'clock in the morning uh, uh, have breakfast and then go and watch at seven. Before I go and watch, I'll have a discussion with my deputy of any defects or issues that happened overnight. Um, whilst I'm on watch, what happens all depends on what the submarine's doing. Because I'm in the control room, which is the nerve center of the submarine, um, it varies. It, we can be very quiet if we're deep running uh, underneath the water, or it could be very busy if we're at periscope uh, depth during an exercise. Uh, that watch will end at one o'clock. I'll have lunch. Uh, and then go and do some administration, maintenance, main, uh, auditing, uh, reviewing of some defects. I might head back to the uh, engine room and have a chat to the, the team that's on watch uh, and then have a nap for about two hours before I get up, have dinner and go back and watch at seven o'clock at night. Um, repeat that over again and finish at one o'clock in the morning before uh, getting some sleep for the rest of the night. Oh, wow. Uh, so Aaron has asked what kind of leadership experiences uh, you had had prior to joining Navy as an officer. Hmm. Any? <laughs> so uh, before joining the Navy, I, I was a, um, in Scouts and uh, within Scouts as a, um, a patrol leader. Uh, I also uh, was a member of a sailing club and used to help out as the youth representative uh, in the sailing club. Also had a minor role from uh, within school, but that was uh, nothing uh, to be uh, to report home about. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, having gone through civilian uni, uh, that gave me a few different opportunities to lead different groups at uni um, and do different uh, leadership roles throughout uni. Uh, so that was, I guess, the, the experience that I could I could get. Mm. I had a minor role uh, during high school, um, but ha having said that though, um, the Navy does provide you a lot of opportunities to um, develop your leadership skills um, and be able to work on that because you're dealing with people pretty much every single day um, and that's definitely a key uh, aspect of your job, being able to lead people. And just further to Deidre's comment that the Navy's leadership courses are civilian accredited, so you come away with uh, having um, Certificate for in frontline management and leadership, uh, which you, which is really great, and that you can take away from the Navy if ever you so desire. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, John has asked, what recreational activities are allowed on a ship or sub, either or? <laughs> uh, so there's a range of activities. Um, we do have a music club on board. Um, and there is a drum kit and a guitar oh, cool. and a keyboard. So okay. uh, if you're musically talented, um, those guys get together every now and then and jam out and occasionally <laughs> they'll even do a um, uh, music show. A little um, concert. Yeah, yes. so that, that's really cool. Uh, if not, um, it's just you can watch movies um, in the rec spaces, um, read a book um, if there's a bit of downtime, yeah. Got some neat little spaces. Yeah. For design for that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, on the submarine, um, watching movies and uh, reading books, but we also have uh, on a Saturday night, we typically have a trivia night um, that gets run throughout the submarine and we compete against each mess the senior oh. sailors' mess, the junior sailors' mess, the wardroom, the uh, engine room, watchkeepers, and uh, the operations room. Typically, the senior sailors and the wardroom do really well. Um, but it's a good bit of fun and ties in we also with that. Well, we have we have a themed pizza night as well to back it up. So pizza and wedges and uh, soft drinks are typically the, the go. But it's going to be a good bit of fun there. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> Emily asked, "What's the best thing you can do to mentally and physically prepare yourself for NEOC uh, and life in the Navy in general?" It's a tough one, Emily. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think if, if don't underestimate. Um, 
how demanding it can be and how much of a, sh um, I won't say a shock, but it's a change to your lifestyle. You are going into a military outfit. The Navy is a professional body, uh, but it is more than just a job. It is a lifestyle and it will be different to anything else that you've done before. Mm. For myself, I made sure that I did my push-ups, sit-ups, did a, and run more than what was the basic requirement to get in. So I was um, as fit as I can be. And if you're fit, you're also typically mentally um, agile and resilient as well, which is also quite useful for that uh, new entry officers course. Yeah, yeah. Fitness, yeah. fitness is definitely a, a good thing. Um, and I guess uh, don't underestimate how much uh, that can benefit you as well uh, further down the track. Uh, the, the easier you find some of those fitness components, the more energy you've got to put into other things that you are struggling with. Mm -hmm. So uh, being physically fit when you start off can, can really help you get through the, the other bits. For Emily, I think she can take away that she's not in it alone. Um, she'll have a whole cohort of um, other new entry officers as well going through the same thing. So, um, rely on them get to build a relationship with them and like bounce it off each other and develop a friendship that you can be able to rely on i think that's really important that's great advice yeah. so reese has asked for simon how many technicians do you manage on board a submarine okay reese so the marine engineering department is uh 16 there's one chief petty officer who's my deputy marine engineer officer then we have three petty officers uh and then four leaning seamen uh, and an array of able seamen uh, working for those leaning seamen as well. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that varies occasionally depending on what we're doing, but typically the department is 16. Okay. Uh, so Andy asks, what's the best thing about being in the Navy and how do you go about being away from your family? So I think I can answer those at the same time. Um, okay. One of the best things, especially on board submarines, is that the crew becomes your family when you're deployed. So you don't, I find it um, quite easy to sail away from my family. I know it sounds a little bit heartless, but I have that emotional support yeah, within yeah. it. And everyone is wearing the same uniform. Everyone's gone through similar experiences. As Deidre was saying, you're all in this together. Yeah. Um, and that camaraderie that we get within, especially within submarines is fantastic. And I love going to sea. Um, the only downside is be, sometimes being away from my family and then yeah. my wife's going to, yeah, you're enjoying it too much. But so that, so that's the great thing about being in the Navy. One of the, yeah. um, how do I manage being away from my, my family? Um, constant communication wherever possible, the family grams that we have once a week, that signal we can send. Uh, as I mentioned before, writing that letter, that's the way I keep connected and my wife keeps connected. Mm. And making every opportunity uh, to get in contact and do something special when you have that chance. I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the Making the effort when you can, I think is a, a big thing for me. Uh, to be able to, if I've got the chance to communicate, I'm always trying to communicate. Um, fortunately, being on a surface ship, uh, it's a little bit easy to communicate at sea, so I, I can do that a bit more frequently. Um, but putting in that effort to communicate. But having said that, I just love going to sea as well. Um, the team is great, uh, but I also just love spending time up on the bridge, uh, mm. getting to look out, getting to see everything. You get to see so much of the world that most people don't see. Um, one of the great watches, uh, morning and dogs watch. When you're, when you're on that rotation, you get to both watch the sun rise in the morning and set in the evening. So things like that are, are really amazing. Yeah, I totally agree with what these guys have said about communication, um, but the Navy does try and um, integrate families into the Navy as mm. well. So uh, recently, earlier this year, we had a families cruise, so we were able to invite family members on board so they could see what it was like, oh, cool. uh, <laughs> see what our job was like, um, and understand what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's also other organisations like Defence Community Organisations that uh, reach out to family members uh, when there's a new posting or if you post to a new location uh, and help families get in touch with services such as uh, daycare or uh, anything that getting a new job. So they're really good to rely on as well. Yeah, fantastic. Zaldan asked, uh, having young children myself, how often are you relocated to different bases? 
sure that's different for all of you. Mm. <laughs> um, it depends on which stage of your career you are. Uh, you are, you can have some career stability from a submarine perspective. All our submarines are based in the west, just south of Perth at HMS Stirling. So the majority of your time as a submariner is going to be in West Australia, which is great from that perspective. Uh, there is the opportunity, uh, I'm in Canberra at the moment, uh, that's an opportunity to get out there. You can also, have, there's submariners positions um, elsewhere across the country, in Adelaide, in Melbourne, and here in uh, Sydney. Um, so that is that posting stability so you can um, support your family. Mm. But if you do move, as Deidre was just saying before, the defence community organisation can support you in finding childcare support, helping your partner find another job if required, um, and having that. So it minimises that stress. And Defence also supports you um, financially if you own a home to sell that home and buy a new home in your new location. They provide housing, uh, a subsidised housing for your family wherever you move as well. So at the moment I live in a what we call a Defence Housing uh, Association's house um, and I pay a subsidised rent to live in that place, um, which is great from that perspective. So there is definitely that support for families to move. Yeah, so from an a maritime warfare officer perspective, it's very dependent on that specialisation. Uh, similar sort of thing to submariners. Uh, if you're in certain specialisations, it will uh, reduce where you're going to be posted to. Uh, however, once your initial training's finished and you, you're fully qualified, a general posting is generally about two years. Uh, sometimes it's a bit more than that, uh, but generally two years is a, a normal posting and that'll be one job. You may still be in the same place in your next job, but uh, it's generally two years per job. Yeah, so it's similar for uh, maritime logistics officers. Uh, they're predominantly based um, in Sydney or over in Fleet Base West um, and you'll be serving on the major fleet units over there. Uh, so for your sea time, um, you'll be spending your time either over there or in Sydney. Um, but there's also other avenues if you uh, need to post somewhere um, and you want to leave your family uh, in location wherever they may be, um, you can go unaccompanied, uh, which is what I did last year. Um, and Defence will provide opportunities uh, for you to be reunited up to six times a year with the family. And that's um, covered great. for you, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, now Michelle has asked, what about hospitality roles on a ship? Now, I guess, uh, <laughs> Deirdre, that's sort of um, your basket. Now we actually talked to you yesterday uh, in your work environment on board HMAS Canberra. So let's have a look at uh, your job role now. I'm here with Deirdre. Can you tell us for starters where we are and about your job role as a maritime logistics officer? So currently we're in the naval stores. It's one of five compartments and my role as the assistant maritime logistics officer is to oversee five departments or sub-departments and that includes the catering, the supply chain, the support ops which is hospitality, uh, personal and administration as well as the medical side. Can you tell me a little bit about your responsibilities uh, as a maritime logistics officer, both on a ship and ashore? So on board a ship, uh, I oversee those five departments that I mentioned earlier, as well as the finance side of things. Uh, in, in addition to that, we focus very much on being able to get the ship to sea and then maintaining the ship at sea, and then also the operational logistics side of things, such as port visits. So how important is your job role in and making sure this ship is running efficiently and effectively? Well, I guess if you don't have uh, the stores or the equipment that we require, we can't get to sea. So making sure that we do have all of that is vital. And then ashore, uh, we also have three core components. Um, it's either core, which is supporting the ships that are at sea, and then the second one is material sustainment, making sure the life cycle of ships uh, be able to operate, and then the joint environment with Army and Air Force. Fantastic. And what are some of the key skills that you've picked up as a maritime logistics officer? There are a number of key skills that I've picked up as a maritime logistics officer. However, one of the main skills for me is leadership because you're in charge of a department up to 60 people. So managing a whole 
a wide range of people across different skill sets, uh, different walks of life can be really interesting as well as challenging sometimes. Um, but that's one of the perks, I guess, of um, being a maritime logistics officer. Another key skill for me is communication and dealing with other departments across the ship and ensuring that their demands and requests are met. Wonderful. Thanks, Deirdre. So we are here for a little while longer. Please make sure you're getting your questions through to us. In the meantime, we'll jump back in. So have you visited any interesting ports overseas and what's the favourite place you've travelled to? That's a really hard question. <laughs> because um, there's so many. Yes, there are. I pretty much have done every continent. Um, so I think going to Africa, we wow. pulled into Tanzania, uh, was probably one of the most eye-opening um, and remarkable experiences. Uh, it's a different, different world over there, and being able to travel there for work um, is probably an amazing opportunity and something that I probably wouldn't have ever done otherwise. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I was lucky enough to get onto a Southeast Asian deployment. Uh, so got to go through about seven countries up in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think Vietnam is probably one of the, the highlights of that. Yeah. Um, just it's the culture that, um, that you get to see is, is really interesting and really different. Um, and uh, the Navy also gives you the opportunity to learn about um, previous naval history uh, and Australian defence history. Um, and so uh, we got to do a tour of uh, the Coochie Tunnels when we were there. So that was really, really interesting. And so definitely one of those highlights from that trip. So I was fortunate as an assistant marine energy officer to be on a frigate went, that went to the Middle East. So I've been to a number of Middle Eastern countries. Uh, on board submarines, I've been to Southeast Asia, to Japan and to New Zealand. I think New Zealand must be one of my favourite places to go all the time. Um, I will go there in a heartbeat, but as a submariner, whenever we pull into a port, we stay in uh, hotels because we can't live on board. We don't live on board whilst we're alongside, uh, which is great from my perspective because I was able to um, fly my wife out. Uh, and so we spent a little bit of our spare time that I had in uh, New Zealand. Um, hiking around uh, some of the mountains of New Zealand. So that was really nice and really wonderful. Amazing. So Belle has asked, uh, I've heard that Navy chefs are the best. Could you describe what a menu on board a ship or sub could look like in a day? Uh, you're <laughs> right. Uh, on submarines, we have some of the greatest chefs on board. They're really keen uh, and enthusiastic to be on board. Um, what My last chef um, was from India. He trained as an uh, Italian chef and worked in a Greek restaurant before he joined the Navy. So uh, you can imagine that the range of foods yeah. was just phenomenal. <laughs> um, breakfast is typically standard um, eggs, bacon, hash browns, anything else the chefs feel like cooking up. Uh, lunch is whatever um, takes the fancy of the, uh, of the chef. I've had duck, salmon, steak, um, and that's the same for dinner. Um, on submarines, we have a, because we have six on, six off, we have a midnight watch or, and we have midnighters and that's typically leftovers from, the, from lunch or dinner um, supplemented with either pie, sausage rolls. Um, but with that, uh, we have sort of um, special nights. So Wednesday is Burger Wednesday and Friday is typically, a, uh, sorry not Friday, Saturday is uh, Pizza Saturday. So the food's pretty good on submarines. I'm not sure what it's like on the on surface ships these days. But. Yeah, I can vouch for that. It's yeah. definitely pretty good. Um, we also have... Um, brunch on Sundays sometimes, not all the time, nice. so that's, <laughs> <laughs> the crew do, do look forward to that. And we also cater for various um, requirements, whether you be a vegan, vegetarian, oh. yeah, so, or any other, like, celiac or dietary yeah. requirements. Yeah, yeah so there'll generally be four options for both lunch and dinner, uh, so you'll get your main option with some veggies and there's salads as well. Um, so there's always something that you you like, um, whatever, uh, and then yeah, there are different um, dietary requirements that we cater for as well. There is a little bit of noise going on down here in the dock <laughs> at the moment. That's what you get with the Facebook Live. Um, now, Sinead asks, what is the gap year for the Navy like and what do you do in the gap year? 
Yeah, so this is a uh, really great program. Uh, it essentially allows you to uh, go out to all the different uh, departments um, and areas and get you to get you exposed to see what that's like. It's essentially a try before you buy. Uh, so it's a one year program um, and there's uh, officer program coming out uh, so you can get around to all the officer um, roles in the Navy um, and see what you actually potentially want to do before you uh, sign up for but a longer term. You get to experience term. Yeah. a little bit of everything, don't you? Yeah, Pretty so much. You, you get to go around, be on board a ship, see what that's like and move around the different areas on that ship yeah. um, as well as getting ashore and doing different roles ashore. So you get to experience all different facets of Navy life, um, get to see whether that's a thing you want. Uh, as Deidre says, there's both a, an officer one that they're, they're looking at starting up now as well, so that you, you're more focused on those officer roles rather than the sailor roles, which mm. there is at the moment. Yeah, yeah great. Erin asks, what's the community like on board? So, teamwork, I suppose. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's it's pretty it's pretty not tight knit. Mm. It's uh, really great, uh, essentially, to be able to get the ship out to sea and make sure it runs. All the departments mm. need to communicate with each other, um, and we all rely on each other one way or another. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, teamwork's really really vital. And you're living so close, maybe not as close as on a submarine, but you, <laughs> you're stuck with the people for, it could be quite a while, um, so to have that teamwork and that, that friendliness and close-knit community really, really helps to get things done and helps everyone get along. Yeah, absolutely. For so submarines, as you sort of mentioned, we're uh, living in close confines, yes, but we work um, on board as a tight-knit team. Everyone has a role to play within the submarine. Um, we're all submariners, so we've all got that same qualification. We've had similar experiences. So it's really close-knit. It's almost like a family. Uh, and that extends beyond just the submarine as well, which is great whenever you go ashore, you talk to other submariners, be it in the Australian Navy or foreign navies, there's always an instant camaraderie that you can exchange and start talking to. So it's great from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as uh, we're sitting here for the Navy officer Q&A. You are all in priority roles at the moment. So uh, if you are looking at putting in an application, these are all priority roles. Now one uh, other role that we don't have with us today is a training system specialist. Um, but we did spend some time yesterday with a training system specialist. Her name was Amanda. We spent some time on HMA's Canberra having a talk about her role. So let's have a look at that. I'm here with Amanda. Amanda, can you tell us where we are? Yeah, sure. So we're standing on the bridge wing of HMAS Canberra. Can you tell me a little bit about your job role as a training system specialist and what kind of qualifications you need for that role? Sure. So as a training system specialist, uh, I am responsible for the training requirements or de developing the training requirements for Navy to deliver its capability. <laughs> um, Part of that role or much of that role involves talking to other people about what they do and um, taking what they do in their job and then converting that into a training outcome. So I have a Bachelor of Education, all training systems officers are, are university graduates and those qualifications which may include a Bachelor of Education in vocational education or tertiary education or even HR gives the background and the skill sets required for uh, per people to be able to utilise those skills in training development for Navy requirements. So take me through some of your day-to-day -day duties as a training system specialist, particularly on board a ship. Sure. So as a training system specialist, as I've said, much of my job role involves talking to other people about what they do and then converting that into training. With a ship like this, um, we're specifically engaged here to manage the training requirements for this platform. So that might be uh, that might involve managing the embarked forces on a, on the platform. So that could include army, or it could include ADFA trainees, gap years, or anyone else that. Um, the Navy is trying to get exposure to life at sea and um, those requirements. So we're solely managing that uh, aspect as well as the training for the ship's company. And is that all specific to your job role as a training system specialist? Yeah, it is specific to a training system specialist role. Uh, the skill sets that we have uh, make us unique in um, our ability to be able to pr provide that capability for Navy.
And what advice would you give to a candidate looking at this kind of job role for their career? I love my job, so the best part of it is being exposed to what everybody else does in the Navy. So that means I get to see a range of things that you wouldn't normally expect to see in an average job or a day-to-day -day job. So part of my job might consist of talking to um, aviation specialists and working with them about um, developing training to ensure the helicopters are working uh, appropriately in the way that we want them to be used. Or it might involve talking to um, warfare officers about um, firing torpedoes or um, it could even involve working with submariners to make sure that they're um, trained appropriately to, to uh, utilise our submarines. So uh, the best draw card for me is that dynamic environment. If you're looking for something that's out of the ordinary and something that's going to challenge you on a day-to-day basis I think this is a perfect job for it. Thanks Amanda. Thank you guys we have your final questions here and we'll uh, jump straight into them so Kevin has asked can you please talk a bit uh, further about career development opportunities for naval officers so staff school joint operations training uh, grad school etc. Okay so uh, perhaps I can talk about that so once you've completed your initial training you're part of what we call the trained force um, further opportunities beyond leadership training and, and, and promotion training. There, uh, there are um, what we call the Australian Command and Staff course, which is run in Canberra. It's equivalent to a master's, one year of intensive study. Um, and that's across Navy, Army and Air Force. And we bring in um, a fallen military students as well. There's opportunities to do similar courses overseas. I have a friend who's going to, to Japan in a couple of years to do their Jap wow. Japanese staff course. Similarly, um, there is a what we call the Capability Technology Ma managers program which is focused about capability development building up our future engineers and uh, staff officers uh, for the continuous shipbuilding program that we're embarking on as you progress up the ranks around the lieutenant lieutenant commander level that's where we start getting a bit more joint i recently completed what we call the introduction to joint operations course which is run out of uh, newcastle which is we learn about uh, ships like our um, canberra behind us and their role within what we call the joint space, working with Army, Air Force, and other units, uh, other navies and armies as well. Fantastic. Now, John has asked, and this is a very important question, do you have to do your own laundry on a ship? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do have to do our own laundry on the ship. However, there is um, laundry facilities, uh, so that's all covered. Not a problem. And a dryer, so it can go straight in the dark dryer. <laughs> All right, and finally, what is the most important skill the Navy has taught you as an officer? I think from my perspective, my most important skill as an engineer, typically an introvert, uh, is people management skills and being able to lead and manage. I think that's great. Um, yeah. When I compare it to some of my colleagues uh, as, and friends who I went through university with, that is definitely an advantage that I have over them, uh, having an exposure to leadership and management. Yeah. For me, it's the way the Navy teaches written communication. So uh, it really formalises everything uh, and being a science background, um, that really helped me. Uh, something that I always struggled with was the, the written communication. So to have an easy way of formatting things and going through that mm. and being able to professionally produce uh, written communication, um, it's really through that training that the Navy's given me. I totally agree with Andy on that one. Um, we end up doing a lot of administration pay, uh, paperwork, um, so being able to have that um, down pat mm. is uh, really, really important. Another one is communication for me, um, being able to liaise with other departments across the ship. Yeah, yeah. that's one of the key skills. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, guys for answering our questions today and thank you for joining us. Now, the role of Maritime Warfare Officer, Marine Engineer Submariner, Maritime Logistics Officer and Training Systems Specialist are all priority roles. So if you're looking to become an officer in the Navy, then be sure to jump onto our website for more info or to start an application. Thank you again and we'll see you at the next Q&A.